I'm Dr. Chris Aiken. I'm Dr. Greg Malsberg. And I'm Kelly Newsom, a psychiatric NP, and we'll bring you the top psychiatric stories from the past month, free of industry support. Highlights from this month include lumateperone, lavender, treatment-resistant smoking, and clonidine patches and Tourette's. A new meta-analysis published in Psychiatry Research sheds light on a critical question. How long should patients continue taking antidepressant after recovery from depression? This study, led by researchers from Southeast University in China, analyzed data from 35 randomized controlled trials involving over 9,000 patients with major depression. They found the risk of relapse after stopping antidepressants was significantly related to the duration of initial treatment. So what were the key findings? On average, about 35% of patients relapsed within six months of discontinuing antidepressants, and about 45% relapsed within one year. The risk of relapse was relatively high when antidepressants were taken for less than three months. This risk decreased after three months of treatment. There didn't appear to be any additional reduction in relapse risk when antidepressants were continued beyond six months. And lastly, younger age was associated with a higher likelihood of relapse after stopping the medications. The results support current guidelines recommending that antidepressants be continued for at least four to nine months after acute treatment response. However, they question the added benefit of longer durations. There were some limitations. There was a lack of trials examining treatment beyond nine months, an inability to fully account for differences between studies. However, the findings provide important insight to help clinicians and patients weigh the benefits and risks of long-term antidepressant use. This study suggests targeting a sweet spot of around six months, which may optimize relapse prevention while avoiding unnecessarily prolonged treatment for many patients with major depression. For now, the results confirms the findings of earlier studies that at least six months of antidepressants is helpful, but also reassures us that indefinite continuation may not be necessary for all. Lumateperone, Caplita, is FDA approved in bipolar depression, but until this next study came out, we didn't know whether this antipsychotic could also augment antidepressants in major depressive disorder. Now, technically, this study hasn't really come out. It's available in abstract form, so we can only skim the surface of what they found. This was an industry-sponsored trial of 485 patients that lasted six weeks. And like most antipsychotic studies, it tested the drug in patients who had failed one or two antidepressants. So that's not the level of true treatment resistance that requires at least two failed antidepressant trials. To its credit, lumateperone separated from placebo with a medium effect size of 06 That's consistent with the drug's robust effects in bipolar depression, where it has a similar effect size. And it's bigger than the effects we've seen with some of its competitors, like brexpiprazole and cariprazine in major depression. But whether this big effect holds up in a second study is yet to be seen. And we expect that to come out soon, as the company will need to do that to earn FDA approval that they're seeking. This next depression trial is the same size as the lumateperone one, but the medication they tested is of a very different nature. Siegfried Casper and colleagues tested a branded extract of the lavender plant, Silexan, in 489 patients with mild to moderate depression. They tested it against a placebo and an effective antidepressant, sertraline 50 milligrams. After eight weeks, lavender equaled sertraline and both drugs surpassed placebo. Silexin has regulatory approval for generalized anxiety disorder in 12 European countries, but this is its first foray into major depression. Although it is a prescription in Europe, it is available over-the-counter in the U.S. as CarMaid, which is made by the pharmaceutical company that produces the prescription form. Now, that separates it from other natural products in the U.S., many of which suffer from inconsistent manufacturing and are supported by only small clinical trials. Lavender's anxiety trials are also large, and there it has a large effect size, even surpassing paroxetine and equaling lorazepam in head-to-head comparisons. In anxiety, the dose is 160 milligrams per day, and we suspect the drug was underdosed in this depression study at only 80 milligrams per day. Silexan has serotonergic, GABAergic, and glutamatergic effects. And to learn how to use it, check out the July 2020 issue of the Carlite Psychiatry Report. 
Given the concerns about the addictive potential of benzodiazepines, a large cohort study from Denmark, published in the American Journal of Psychiatry, suggests that long-term use of these medications may be less problematic than often believed. Researchers found that doses rose to high levels in only a small proportion of patients prescribed benzodiazepines and Z drugs over time. The study followed nearly 4.3 million adults in Denmark from 2000 to 2020 and looked at the over 900,000 who started benzos and Z hypnotics like Zolpidem. What were their findings? First, long-term use was rare. Only 15% continued use for more than one year and 3% for more than seven years. Only 5% of patients with at least three years of continuous use escalated to doses higher than recommended guidelines. How high is that? You have to convert to diazepam equivalents, and the max they used was 40 milligrams diazepam for patients under 65 or 20 milligrams if 65 or older. And they found that substance use disorders, particularly with alcohol, were associated with greater risk of both long-term use and dose escalation. The findings suggest that risk of dose escalation on benzodiazepine-related drugs is relatively low. We have to keep in mind this was an observational study and only looked at a Danish cohort, which is a country with strict prescribing regulations. So it's unclear if this generalizes to countries with different healthcare systems. However, the findings provide reassurance that with appropriate safeguards, these drugs can be used safely for extended periods in many patients. The authors caution that these results do not negate the need for careful patient selection and monitoring. Patients with psychiatric comorbidities, especially substance use disorders, should be prescribed benzodiazepine-related drugs judiciously and receive close follow-up to prevent misuse. This study suggests the fear of inevitable dose escalation with long-term benzodiazepine-related drugs may be overblown. With judicious prescribing and monitoring, these medications can be a valuable tool for managing appropriately selected patients. A recent study published in Psychiatry Investigation offers new hope for children and adolescents with Tourette syndrome and comorbid ADHD. Researchers from China found that clonidine adhesive patches can safely and effectively reduce tic symptoms in this population, with potential benefits for ADHD as well. The multi-centered, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial included 127 patients aged 6 to 18 years with both Tourette syndrome and ADHD. The participants were randomly assigned to receive either clonidine patches at doses of either 1 mg per week, 1.5 mg per week, or 2 mg per week, and they compared those dosages to placebo for a total of eight weeks. What were the key findings? First, clonidine worked better than placebo, with an impressive number needed to treat of two. All three doses worked equally well at improving ticks. Although clonidine is FDA approved in ADHD, in this study though, it didn't bring about a significant difference in ADHD symptoms. And finally, only nine mild to moderate skin-related adverse effects occurred in this population of 127, and all of them resolved spontaneously. Now, clonidine patches were well tolerated at all doses in this study. Clonidine is already recommended first line in treatment guidelines for Tourette's disorder. So what does this new study add? Well, compared to earlier trials, this one has a better design and a larger sample size with a placebo control. Earlier studies, most of which were from the 1980s, used an active comparator like another drug or used a crossover design instead of a randomized controlled trial design. This trial also expands the range of clonidine formulations that we might consider to include transdermal patch. Now the patch is applied weekly and it may be better tolerated for some. In studies of hypertension, the clonidine patch caused less fatigue and dry mouth than the oral version. Smokers who don't succeed in quitting with first-line treatments, like varenicline chantix or combined nicotine replacement therapy, may benefit from increasing the dosage or switching medications, according to a new randomized clinical trial published in JAMA. In this double-blind placebo-controlled trial, 490 smokers were randomized to receive varenicline, 2 mg per day, or combined NRT, a 21 mg patch plus 2 mg lozenges, for 6 weeks. Those who hadn't quit at that point 
were then randomized to either continue their initial therapy, switch to other treatment, or increase the dosage to 3 mg a day for Reticlin or 42 mg patch plus lozenges for another six weeks. What were the key findings? Among varenicline non-responders, increasing the dosage led to a 20% abstinence rate at the end of treatment, compared to 3% with continued initial dosing and 0% after switching to combined NRT. For combined NRT non-responders, both increasing the dosage and switching to varenicline resulted in 14% abstinence rate, compared to 8% with continued combined NRT. Only the increased dosages of varenicline and combined NRT produce better long-term quit rates than continuing initial dosages. These results support increasing varenicline to 3 mg per day in smokers who don't quit on the standard 2 mg per day dose. For combined NRT non-responders, either raising the nicotine patch dose or switching to varenicline appear to be reasonable strategies, with some evidence favoring the dosage increase approach. Overall, the findings provide much-needed evidence to guide treatment adjustments following an unsuccessful quit attempt on two first-line smoking cessation aids. To recap, if your patient is taking varenicline and doesn't respond, raise the dose from 2 to 3 mg per day. If they're using nicotine replacement patch and don't respond, you can either raise the dose of the patch, like from 21 to 42 mg per day, or switch to varenicline. By identifying tactics to improve outcomes in this challenging group, this research may help more smokers achieve abstinence despite initial treatment failure. Clinicians should consider these dosage increase and switching strategies to enhance success rates. A recent meta-analysis published in Obesity Surgery raises concerns about the development of new onset substance use disorders following bariatric surgery. Researchers from Italy and Canada found that patients who undergo weight loss surgery may be at heightened risk for substance abuse, particularly opioid use. The study analyzed data from seven cohort studies involving over 116,000 patients who underwent bariatric procedures, such as Roux and Y gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomy. What were the findings? One in 28 patients developed a new substance use disorder after bariatric surgery. Chronic opioid use was the most common type of new onset substance abuse disorder, reported in about 22% to 100% of affected patients. Risk factors for developing new onset substance abuse disorders included pre-existing mental health disorders, public health insurance, higher surgical BMI, and post-operative complications or chronic pain. This is a serious concern, but why does it happen? The intuitive explanation is that people are replacing food addiction with another addiction. The authors point out some similarities between highly processed foods and drugs of abuse, like rapid absorption, concentrated dose, dopaminergic effects. Both are known to cause cravings and continuous use, despite negative consequences. Patients agree. In one study, 83% of people who developed addictions after bariatric surgery felt they substituted one addiction for another. These explanations make sense, but we'll keep an open mind. So far, the cause is unknown and unproven. The findings highlight the importance of careful patient selection through pre-surgical assessment and ongoing multidisciplinary support to identify and manage risk factors for substance abuse. Monitoring for new signs of new onset substance abuse should be a key aspect of post-op care. Clinicians should educate patients about the possibility of developing substance use disorders, and work closely with them to create personalized prevention and treatment strategies, both before and after surgery. Refining patient selection criteria and optimizing post-op support may help mitigate this concerning complication of weight loss procedures. It's important to know what works, but just as important to know what does not work. So we close with a few failures. Coriprazine in bipolar disorder, levolmanalsopram in pediatric depression, and an antidepressant app. In an industry-funded trial, coriprazine, Vralar, failed to prevent new episodes of bipolar disorder, despite earlier success in treating acute bipolar depression and mania, both of which it's FDA approved for. Now, this was a large study, it was placebo-controlled, and it tested the antipsychotic as monotherapy. The drug failed despite several factors that would have favored it in this study, like an enriched design where only people who responded to cariprazine were included, and early discontinuation. They stopped the drug after two months of recovery, whereas clinically, we recommend waiting at least six months of recovery before trying to come off an antipsychotic and a mood disorder. What's the bottom line here? Well, many mood experts do not consider antipsychotics to be genuine mood stabilizers 
because they don't have as robust evidence to prevent episodes as, say, lithium or valproic acid. And I guess this study helps prove their point. Our next failure is with the SNRI levomonosopram Fetzema in two industry-funded trials of pediatric depression. In that, it joins over a dozen other antidepressants that also failed in this population. That leaves us with only fluoxetine with a strong track record in pediatric depression. Next in line would be escitalopram and citalopram. Only escitalopram is FDA approved, but both of these had a mix of positive and negative trials in pediatric depression. Now, why do so many antidepressants fail in children? The usual answer is that the placebo response in this group is really high, and that suggests that a general supportive approach is helpful enough and antidepressants aren't able to augment that. But that explanation also assumes that the meds must be effective here and that the supportive approach is just riding over that. And that's something that has not been proven. We should keep in mind that childhood depression may be a different disorder. This population has high rates of conversion to bipolar disorder. And for reasons that appear to be completely separate from any issues of bipolarity, antidepressants carry a risk of suicidality in children and young adults under age 25. Coincidentally, the age where the brain is considered fully matured. Our last failure is of a different sort. It's an app for depression, Rejoin. And if you haven't heard of it yet, you probably will soon, because despite the failure, it got FDA cleared for major depression. But FDA clearance is a much lower bar to pass than FDA approval, and Rejoin illustrates that point. The approval was based on a large clinical trial where Rejoin failed to make a difference on the primary outcome measure, although it did succeed on secondary outcomes. We see the same thing with genetic testing, which consistently fails to make a difference on primary outcomes in double-blind controlled trials, but improves a few secondary measures. The problem is that secondary outcomes are prone to all the random errors that make us long for more scientific studies in the first place. So they confirm little while suggesting a lot. But if Rejoin has a placebo effect, it is a much safer placebo than, say, cariprazine or levomonosopram, and that is probably why the FDA cleared it here. The app combines CBT with an emotional training game where the user has to recognize and remember pictures of facial expressions as they flash across the screen. Those are sound ideas, and they may have a genuine effect. I mean, CBT is known to work in depression, and the facial recognition game did improve depression on its own in two small controlled trials of an app that just used that, even though it failed in this larger study. 